Welcome to another edition of the Dementia Care Partner Talk Show. Now, here's dementia care expert Tifa Snow and your host, Greg Phelps. Hello and welcome to the Dementia Care Partners podcast series. I'm your host, Greg Phelps, and joining me as usual is Tifa Snow. First of all, Tifa, I'd like to wish you happy 100th. I know, thank you. I am so thrilled to be at 100. It's fantastic. The 100th I'm not pod- that many years old. <laughs> <laughs> the 100th podcast. So Yay! that's quite an accomplishment. Well, congratulations. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's a it's a statement to or a testament to um, how we've learned to try to share things in bits and pieces and what people can handle. So I I thought today that we could do a a little bit of a longer program, you know, sort of a free for all and uh, a chance to perhaps clean out my inbox and maybe even your in. No, not your inbox, not going anywhere near (laughs) that. I don't think you're doing that in a reasonable amount of time. (laughs) So recently we we mentioned gem. Well, I guess quite frequently we we mentioned gems and I've got a question saying, okay, what are these gems you're talking about? Now, I know that that could be a whole program itself, but can you sort of give a, a thumbnail view of that one? Yeah. Well, for the longest time, the only thing that was out there talking about people and dementia and progression of change was something called early, middle, late. They're in the early state stage of dementia. They're in the middle stage of dementia or they're in the late stage of dementia. And of course, the dementia back then that we were talking about was Alzheimer's because, you know, so they are showing early signs of dementia and what they're going to need is you to pay attention and monitor some of the independent living kinds of things like, can they drive safely? Can they manage their health care safely? Can they live in the location they're in and manage their home or their garden or their can they take their meds safely? Are they doing things they're supposed to? Can they manage their finances safely? And then when we get to the middle of the disease, you will need to monitor and you might need to provide guidance and maybe some environmental or physical bits for things that people do every day, like making sure that they get showers and and baths and they change clothes and that they're eating okay and they're fixing food okay and they're taking care of their bathroom needs okay and they're they're doing things that, that they have a good time doing and they're doing them safely and they are able to, you know, go out and do things with friends and then come into the house and be okay. But that would be sort of an intervention stage, wouldn't it? Isn't that the first? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And usually that's when people notice something's going on here. We're going to have to do something. And you may need to look at, do we need to change where they're living or who they're living with? Do we need to get a little more support in place? Because things can happen day or night and the different dimensions sort of matter. And then there was this late state. I mean, when you were gonna be doing pretty much a lot of physical care, a lot of um, support care, and it was gonna be pretty much 24 seven because wake sleep could be messed up. So it was in the later state. And so that's what was out there. And then this doctor came along and said, oh, I've got seven stages for you. And the first three are normal cognition. And and then the four through seven, well, that's, that's dementia. And it's from, you know, early, middle, late, severe, profound. And it was talking about what can't people do anymore? Uh, What are they not going to be able to do? You know, a little bit of what they could, mostly what they couldn't. Um, And it mostly was tuned into Alzheimer's, but then there was Lewy body and they would just say, well, that's how bad Alzheimer's gets them. And it's like, what? And so that was out there. And then there was Allen cognitive levels, which is six levels of cognitive disability or ability. And they did talk about cues and clues and what people would be interested in and what kind of skills they would have. But the problem was it was originally designed for a group other than dementia. And so once you identify somebody with a developmental disability as having certain needs and abilities, well, I mean, unless something changes, they stay the same. And in mental health, unless the medication's not working or somebody's changing, they stay the same. But in dementia, they change all the time. (laughs) So, At first, I thought, okay, well, we'll just use the Allen cognitive levels, the disability scale. And it was like, well, that's not working. Yeah, it sort of focuses entirely on loss, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And it it talks about, well, now they can't do in this and that stuff. And so it's not horrible, but it's just not helpful. And so I thought, okay, well, what if we saw people as, um, as, as 
who they are. So, but they're precious, they're unique. They are different, but that's just what they got going. So it's an ability-based model. So I focused on what can they still do and what do we need to support or help them do? What kind of environmental changes might we make and what kind of queuing might we switch up to and what kind of things might they be interested in given what they got left? And um, we work a lot about what do people have left. And so when I say words like sapphires and diamonds and emeralds and ambers and rubies and pearls, that, that's a lot easier to wrap your head. Like, I think my mom's moving into a pearl state. Then I think she's becoming severely and profoundly demented. Um, it's just a better language. Plus it says, well, here's what she probably can do. And here's where you'll want to offer some support. But we also now talk about, well, you know, when I sleep each night, I go into a pearl state. The good news is come morning, I go back to sapphire if it's a good day or diamond if it isn't. Um, but the idea that we all have changing brain states every 24 hours. So the difference is I've got somebody who's changing due to abnormal protein formations in their brain um, and they don't get to come back to sapphire. So wherever they are, they are. So how can I support and care for them so they can shine where they are? So you're doing a little more exploring with yeah. this on ability instead of disability. Yeah. So like, for instance, when you're a sapphire, you have a full visual field and you can really take in so much data and, and process it. When you're a diamond, you're sort of like you're where you're where you have tunnel vision. So you can only sort of pay attention to what's in that tunnel. Or if you're looking, you might miss something that's right in front of you because you're so busy seeking things. Um, if you're an emerald, you've got binocular vision. If you're in an amber state, you don't recognize what it is you're looking at in your binocular vision, and you have to touch it and mess with it to figure it out frequently. And when you're a ruby, you're in a ruby state, you're monocular, which means you lose a lot of depth perception and trajectory abilities. And then finally, when you're in a pearl state, uh, vision turns sort of, it's on, it's off, it's on, it's off, depending on how alert you are. So you've 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 broken it down to a, a very basic sort of step there. I, I know from sitting through the occasional class that it's a lot more complicated than that. That was sort of an overview for people. Yeah. Can they go somewhere and find? Do you have videos on this? We do have videos. We also have a, what we call a resource card that has a bit more detail. We have a workbook that has even more detail. We have video clips where you can sort of check out your understanding of what you're seeing and experiencing in the video. And then we go over, oh, well, how about this? And we have uh, webinars and we have, oh, we have a really quick video on our website about the gems. So we've tried to really come up with a lot of things. We, we have a tool that you can use for an emergency situation to sort of, if they're doing this, try this. If this is going on, hmm, turn and see what the possibilities are. This may be where you're at. Um, so we've done a lot with this and we actually have hospitals and facilities and agencies around the world using this model to help us come up with better ways to serve. So you, you've, you've got so many different things and, and I want to get through the mailbag here because we do have, you probably have a list too. We might have to save yours for another day because we have so many. We had talked uh, ooh, a few podcasts ago is that a measure of time uh, about restraints uh, are uh, restraints ever necessary why and what might that look like we didn't quite drill down that far before no, we did not okay so let me ask you this Greg I'm going to give you a question back um, when you're in a motor vehicle what do you put on almost spontaneously these days Besides the radio, it would be my seatbelt. Your seatbelt. Now, when those were first introduced, they were considered these awful restraints that we were forcing people to put on. Why did we have people wear seatbelts in a motor vehicle? What's the, what's the point of it? Well, prevent injury. And it, it, it was demonstrated with science. Yeah, you know, with science, we found out if we did not restrain your body, including a shoulder strap, as a matter of fact, um, you could, when we, you were forcibly stopped, when the car stopped abruptly, you would move forward and you would go through the windshield or you would go into the steering column or you would go out through the windshield and into the road. And so we found that, you know what, having you seated with a seatbelt across you made it more probable you'd survive incidents. So 
what's the good part about putting on your seatbelt? Well, it prevents injuries. So, you know, yeah. that's the, the number one. Uh-huh. And you want to get out of the car. What's the thing you're going to do? Oh, take your seatbelt off. Yeah. Okay. Well, then if you can take it off when you don't need it on, then it's not actually considered a restraint. Mm. Um, so when might we want to use a seatbelt on someone? When might it be helpful to have a seatbelt, like in a seat or in a chair for somebody who's living with dementia? So somebody in a Broda chair, uh, and we can't get into explaining all the details on the different types of chairs, but sometimes people slip and fall. You know, and right, so right. Some... So if I did put that seatbelt on them and they can release it when they want to, it's just there to keep their hips back, but they still have the ability to self-release when they want to release and readjust their position and then hook it back. It would not be considered a restraint. If, however, I have to come and release it, then it means that when you want to get out of that or when you want to move or something, you're not able to do it. It's considered a restraint. And we went through a period of time where we said, well, but, 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 but that'll keep them safe. And the problem was actually when they want to get up, they try to take the chair with them. Um, so what we were finding is people would fall out of the chair, but they were still attached to the chair. So they take the chair with them, whether it's a wheelchair or a chair or over the bed rails. And so um, they would be suspended in space uh, over the bed rails because they're still attached to a waist belt or a, 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 a posy vest or those kinds of things. And those were all things we did, wrist restraints. Um, what we have found is restraining a human being when they can't figure out why or what or how, it tends to increase their internal distress and it increases their cortisol and their adrenaline. It changes their heart rate, their blood pressure, it burns blood sugar. They can actually become so distressed that they feel like they're being tortured or killed or maimed and they will yell and scream. And it's like, well, we're doing it to keep them safe. And you've got to ask your question, uh, no, I think we're doing it because we aren't paying attention to what they're trying to tell us and, and figuring out what it is they're seeking or needing. And so, you know, the times that I have seen that we still tend to use restraint is when I'm moving someone on a gurney and it's a narrow surface and they are moving to some extent, then we would want straps on the gurney because trying to control a body uh, on a gurney when it's moving can be a bit of a challenge uh, and people might be delirious and in need of an emergency service. So we've seen people be restrained like that. If somebody does a fall and does something to their spine or their neck or their head, we restrain their head until we can figure out what's going on because, and we put casts on people. <laughs> we don't want them moving a broken bone. So, you know, it's a tricky question for me, but it is sort of something that we need to think deeply about, not just, a, well, I don't want her to pick at her stitches. And it's like, okay, well, let's look at what we could do to make the stitches less something she would pick at. The, I, I've heard the term chemical restraint. Mm -hmm. Has that gone by the by? Is that- a, Oh, a no, it's still about and it's still around. So a lot of anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic, anti- these meds that we use that suppress the central nervous system in some fashion are considered chemical restraints. They keep a person from doing something. And if our reason for using them is to keep somebody from doing something, uh, they're considered a restraint. Um, if they promote function, then they are not considered a restraint. So for instance, if I, you are very, very anxious and you have for years and years and years taken an anti-anxiety medication, then as you're developing dementia, we may continue to use your anti-anxiety medication because it helps you function more. But we get to a point where now you're somnolent all the time. You're not engaging. You can't even wake up to do it. It's like, okay, we got to reevaluate this because that's no longer a function enhancement medication. It's a promotion of disability, not a improvement in ability. And so the rule is, if we're doing it for our convenience, if we're doing it in order to um, suppress someone, 
that's really one of those, mm, have you tried everything else first? And this is, the, what do you think the most common answer is? Oh, yes. I've tried oh, yeah. everything. Oh, yes. And so both in Canada and the U.S., we're saying, well, tell me what you've tried then. I want to see evidence that you have. Because what's been happening is people start applying these chemicals, and then we add another chemical, and then we're, and pretty soon we have a cocktail. And um, unfortunately, we never went back and said, whoa, okay, well, let's try taking these off. Let's try this music. Let's try bringing her to another environment. Let's try helping her get back in the bed. Let's help her get out. Let's, let's take her to the bathroom. Let's see if she has an impaction. Could she be in pain? I mean, really seeking out what might be causing this distress state or this discomfort because comfortable people don't fall. You know, Tipa, I, I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of the mailbag ever. I'm sorry. That's, that's marvelous though, isn't it? Um, I do have one more question in, in sure. honor of the 100th. Uh, lessons you have learned in the past year. Mm. But I'd throw that one at you lessons I have learned. You can do a whole lot more that feels intimate on Zoom than you ever thought you could. <laughs> intentionally or unintentionally? Uh, sometimes some <laughs> of both. You know, so what I would say is uh, what we've learned to do online is pretty remarkable. Um, I think people have surprised us. People living with dementia have surprised us. And we also have seen, um, I have one lesson I've learned is don't don't jump to conclude. I mean, I already knew this, but don't jump to conclusions. Be curious. Stay curious um, because people will surprise you no matter what you think. People will surprise you. I mean, and both in the good ways and the bad ways. So stay curious because you may find out things you don't want to know, but if you don't ask, you won't know. Um, on the other side of it, you may find out some things that are really remarkable and you're glad you found them out. And I need to know both. So um, staying curious on Zoom is really interesting. I, I have found out that I can do a morning program that's different every morning. And I have done it for now from March of last year through now every morning, except for one or two where power or <laughs> Zoom or Facebook was not functional. I've been on for 10 to 20 minutes every morning uh, with a different topic. And I never thought I would do that. Oh. Oh. Um. I bet you miss traveling. I actually, you know, I do miss some of the traveling. I miss being with people. I mean, I do recognize that there is something about being with other human beings that is essential for being human. Um, and I am glad, I am really glad to have um, my family down this way when they used to be up in Michigan. Boy, am I glad they moved at the start of this. Um, so that we have opportunities to be with grandkids and to take turns and to have support in place and to have a place to come where there's uh, internet, where I don't have to be in an office in Chapel Hill. I mean, that's nice. And a lot of your teaching methods, Tipa, are best in person. The hands on, the yeah. hand under hand is so much easier to demonstrate in person than it is on Zoom. Yeah. And, you know, we've had this amazing Jess from Canada. I mean, she is one of our Canadian, like wonderful people. She showed us you can do hand under hand online. You just have to pretend like your left hand is somebody else's. Raise your little finger up, bring your thumb in and turn it away from yourself and then come in with your right hand, shake hands and then form a platform with your right hand. And sure enough, you can do it. But then you have to remember who you're going to help eat. Because <laughs> if you're feeding yourself, it doesn't work. You got to remember that the person you're helping to eat is over here on that other hand. <laughs> so we're learning to innovate. We are learning to innovate. It, it takes practice and it takes laughter. It takes, I am so sorry that didn't work. <laughs> Let's try it again. Well, Tipa, I think we're going to have to do one more mailbag clearing sometime in the, in the fairly mm. near future. But Yeah, sorry about that. That's we just love it. We love it. If people have questions, we encourage people to uh, email or call or however they want to communicate with us. Uh, thank you very much, Tipa. You are so welcome, Greg. Thank you for keeping track of the mailbag. You've been listening to the Dementia Care Partners podcast series. For more information on today's topics or other information relating to dementia, go to tipasnow.com.